All right, we are going to uh, cover the Chancellorsville campaign, in particular, how the Union Army squandered an opportunity for a decisive victory. Now, you may counter that argument and contend that the campaign and the battle was Lee's greatest victory. And in fact, the Army of Northern Virginia snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Well, perhaps, but keep an open mind and let us take a closer look at what actually happened. Well, before we start the General Hooker bashing, we should look at some of the reforms he implemented in the Army of the Potomac. Well, when he took over in January of 63, the Army was a complete dumpster fire. Demoralization and desertion were rampant. So Hooker had this crazy novel idea that commanders were actually responsible for the welfare of their men. So say what you will about him, he made sure that at a minimum, the troops were paid and well fed. Now, he went and disbanded the idea of the Grand Divisions. This is in part because a lot of the older ineffectual commanders like General Sumner uh, were removed uh, from the Army of the Potomac. And then he had all corps commanders report directly to him. You know, talking about paid and well fed is he implemented these efforts to get rid of corruption and, and bureaucratic nonsense uh, to, to, you know, take care of the troops. He created the Bureau of Military Information, the BMI, uh, to organize and synthesize intelligence. One could argue that this was of limited success during uh, this Chancellorsville campaign, but later in the war and starting with the Gettysburg campaign proved to be of, of infinite value. He consolidated the cavalry arm into a separate corps under General Stoneman and took the opposite approach, much to the detriment of the army of disaggregating the artillery and taking army level assets and placing them in, in the control of corps and division commanders. All right, so let's look at the situation as the campaign starts and Hooker's plan. Well, Hooker wanted to create a dilemma for Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. His concept is to get Lee to abandon his works at Fredericksburg, get him out in the open and fight him on his terms. So what he's going to do here is divide his army into two forces, flanking force and a fixing force. So the flanking force is going to cross the Rappahannock to the northwest, come out of the wilderness and get in behind uh, Fredericksburg. Meanwhile, Stoneman is going to take his cavalry corps, go on a raid, and try to blow up the bridges, uh, Hanover uh, Junction. Uh, which would effectively separate Lee from his, his, his main supply line, which was the Richmond, Fredericksburg, uh, and Potomac Railroad. So the fixing force is going to demonstrate at Fredericksburg and maneuver as the situation develops. So Lee has this dilemma. It, which of these threats, if any, is he going to react to? So if Hooker has his way, Lee will abandon his works at Fredericksburg and retreat towards Richmond or launch some bloody useless attack and be decisively defeated. Two, one. Well, the campaign gets started on 27 April. So as you can see, Hooker has seven infantry corps in addition to the uh, cavalry corps. Lee has Jackson's corps, the second corps with the divisions of AP Hill, Rhodes, Colston and Early. Uh, reporting directly to Lee are two independent divisions, and that would be from, of Anderson and McClaws. These two divisions were part of Longstreet's Corps, but Longstreet at this time was on duty in southeast uh, Virginia. So 27 April, three corps from Hooker's flanking force begin the movement, and that would be the 5th 11th and 12th Corps. On 28 April, the next day, Hooker's force is going to cross the Rappahannock. And again, this is the flanking force. The second corps under Darius Couch uh, moves to Banks Ford. And then you have the fixing force, which is the sixth corps. And the first corps uh, move as part of the deception plan and uh, in, in supported by the third corps towards the Rappahannock. So on 29th of April, 
flanking force continues to move. Second Corps moves to U.S. Ford, and the, both the 6th and the 1st Corps send a division across the Rappahannock to a demonstration again to fix Lee's force and place at Fredericksburg. Of course, Lee is not going to sit around and do nothing if you know anything about him. So let's look at the reaction by General Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia to this sudden threat. So Lee responds with having Early's division dig in and facing the threat and moves uh, the rest of Jackson's Corps closer to Fredericksburg. He does have some incomplete and sporadic reports of Union activity to the West. It doesn't understand the size of the composition of this flanking force. Anderson moved to Chancellorsville and later Anderson will move back to Tabernacle Church on, on the morning of the 30th. Well, on 30 April, Lee finally gets good intel on Hooker's flanking force from Jeb Stuart. Interestingly, Hooker halts the forward elements of said flanking force to allow the second and third corps to close up. And Lee, not one to waste time and suffer from indecision, takes action by moving the bulk of his forces to the west to face that flanking force. And let's talk about Stoneman for a second here. Not effective indeed. He did not provide good intelligence. He was unable to launch any sort of effective raids anywhere, much less against Hanover Junction, and had no ability to tie down Stuart, as you can see. Well, let's get oriented to this map. As you can see, Hooker has four infantry corps ready to advance on Fredericksburg with the Third Corps on its way. Note that Gibbon's division from the Second Corps is at Falmouth. So Lee has the bulk of Stuart's cavalry screening his area of operations. And only Early's division and Barksdale's brigade of Mississippians are at Fredericksburg. Here's Early and here's Barksdale on Mary's Heights. So finally, the flanking force can get out of the wilderness. Union forces were very confident. In fact, the Second Corps commander, Couch, bet General Pleasanton, who would eventually replace Stoneman as commander of the Cavalry Corps, a box of cigars that the army would be behind Fredericksburg that evening. Well, the Union advance was met by determined resistance from both Anderson and McClaws. Now, Hooker, instead of continuing to advance, orders his units to return back to their start lines and dig in. Now, this is much to the chagrin of his subordinates. Essentially, Hooker has ceded the initiative, yet he remained very confident, believing that Lee would attack him frontally at Chancellorsville, essentially against the 12th, 2nd, and 5th Corps. So here we are, the 2nd of May, the day of uh, Jackson's famous uh, flank march. It starts harmless enough with the, the 1st Corps ordered to move and protect Hooker's exposed right flank. Well, the Kamo problems are worthy of a separate video. I mean, it, it was a complete cluster that prevented Reynolds first Corps from getting to the area to support Hooker in a timely fashion. So Anderson McClaws now play the role of a fixing force with Wilcox's brigade moving to cover Banks Ford. So now in the afternoon, Jackson conducts his march. However, Union forces observe the column and a fight ensues around Catherine Furnace. A couple of points here. Jackson was very lucky. Number one, recent rains prevented the usual dust clouds that were easy to spot. Two, balloons. Yeah, that's right, balloons. High winds prevented the Union balloons from operating effectively. 
And three, the logical fallacy of confirmation bias. Indeed, Hooker expected his opponent to withdraw. And the reports only confirmed that in his mind. Classic case of confirmation bias. In the next slide, we'll see the results, the dramatic, and to Hooker, traumatic. Be that as it may, in late afternoon, Jackson forms up his three divisions and decimates the 11th Corps. In a historical game changer, Jackson is mortally wounded by his own troops. A.P. Hill was even lucky to escape death, ending up slightly wounded in the same debacle. So command of the Corps is given to Jeb Stuart. Now, now, Sickles gets permission from Hooker to launch a night counterattack. Now, it achieved nothing except incidents of friendly fire and confusion. Now let's let's keep things into perspective here. The Union Army may be stunned at this point, but it is far, far from beaten. One. So in the morning of 3 May, we see Hooker with this odd salient. So he's going to pull back the Third Corps, which gives the rebels an artillery platform on Hazel Grove to rake Union lines. And one wonders why Dan Sickles did what he did on July 2nd at Gettysburg. Well, he continues the attack at Chancellorsville, and oddly enough, the 5th and 1st Corps remain inactive against their commander's wishes. Okay, you know, Reynolds of the 1st Corps, Meade of the 5th. I mean, if they attacked, they could have potentially crushed the three divisions uh, now led by Stuart. Meanwhile, at Fredericksburg, the Sixth Corps finally takes action and begins to assault uh, Mary's Heights. Two, one. Let's walk through this step by step. So Sedgwick attacks, captures Mary's Heights. So this is going to force early to withdraw to the southwest. But the Sixth Corps is going to kind of move slowly, and Wilcox is going to put up a heck of a fight, a heck of a delaying action, and is going to halt Sixth Corps advance at Salem Church. Well, Hooker, under intense artillery fire, orders a redeployment of his forces, and he is also injured by this cannonball that hits the wooden pillar and the pillar comes down and knocks him unconscious. He's out for at least an hour. Uh, Darius Couch wants to take control of the units. It goes back and forth. Hooker retains command. And then there was this kind of led to accusations of him being drunk and so on and so forth. But be that as it may, Hooker is not the same after he's concussed, which, as you can imagine, would be the case. So Lee's going to reunite his forces at Chancellorsville, and he's going to shift his main effort against Sedgwick at Fredericksburg. Having been halted, Sedgwick falls back to defensive positions around Scott's Ford. Lee maintains the initiative and moves against Sedgwick. Well, now, despite being successful in repelling those attacks, the Sixth Corps evacuates the bridgehead on the night of 4 May. So finally, a concussed and shaken hooker retreats on the 6th of May. Well, that's it. Or is it? Well, so what? What does this battle come to? With Jackson gone, Lee has to go into Pennsylvania with two untested Corps commanders. A.P. Hill was, and probably always will be, an enigma at Gettysburg. 
and Richard Ewell was suspect at best. And it was a costly victory. I mean, the, the casualties for the, the Army of Northern Virginia was over 13,000 men. And Lee was extremely frustrated because the decisive victory he sought eluded him once again. I mean, he wanted a battle on his terms that led to the outcome that he desired. As for the Army of the Potomac, well, the high command continued to be in uh, disarray. Couch left uh, Slocum as early as the 7th of May, as soon as the Army was getting back into their camps uh, around Falmouth, shopped around the idea among the other corps commanders of a coup. And Hooker continued to run his mouth, alienating everyone except his closest supporters. He, in writing, went after Stoneman, uh, Sedgwick, and, 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 uh, and Oliver Otis Howard, the commander of the 11th Corps. I mean, the blame was well placed, but that's not how you go about, about doing it. So his days were numbered, and essentially the general in chief of Union forces, Henry Halleck, started to lay the bureaucratic trap that would force Hooker to resign during the Gettysburg campaign. Uh, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel as uh, I shall endeavor to put fresh content up here uh, every week. By the way, you know, the first time I, I saw this picture, I was wondering who this, this older gentleman here is on the right with the party hat and he looked rather rotund and so forth and so on. Uh, after some searching, I found uh, a thread on civilwartalk.com and believe it or not, this gentleman was the uh, unit chaplain. So, all right. Thanks again. And we'll see you next week.